All right, well, Pokemon Sword and Shield are out, which means that one of the most self-destructive and controversial marketing campaigns ever to be run by a video game company has finally ended. I mean, shit, like the game or not, Game Freak lied and Thank You Game Freak trended on Twitter in the same week. Safe to say this was a pretty controversial game release. So thus begs the question, how did these games actually land? Are they the mainline Pokemon game that Game Freak promised they would be, or are they the burning dumpster fire that some fans claim they are? Well, in reality, the games landed on three legs. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And since I like to put my best foot forward, we'll start with the good. It could be pretty accurately stated that this game does a lot of what Pokemon has done well for years. There's an absolutely amazing soundtrack, some very solid new Pokemon designs, and they've certainly improved on features like Pokemon Ami with the new Pokemon camping feature. If you enjoy Pokemon games, it's safe to say that you're going to enjoy this game as well, plain and simple. But that's not a surprise, I mean even I said that this game would probably excel in these aspects months ago, because let's face it, Pokemon as a concept is just fun, and catching, battling, and evolving new Pokemon will never get boring. However, doing what other games have done right is far from what the pinnacle of Sword and Shield have to offer. If the 8th generation of Pokemon has shown us one thing in spades, it's how much Game Freak is willing to shake up the tried and true formula of Pokemon up. For instance, gone are the days of the Elite Four, gone are the days of Victory Road, gone are the days of the fossil Pokemon all needing to be Rock-type. And hell, you can even ride your bike on water, which seems to be a symbolic fuck you to Professor Oak. And look, while some fans bemoan what we lost, I for one really enjoyed the change of pace. To reach new ground, sometimes you need to break old ground, and that's exactly what we see done here. The final tournament which replaces the Elite Four was infinitely better than most of the championship experiences I've ever played through. Harkening back to Black 2 and White 2's Pokemon World Championship, which was indisputably the best feature that has ever existed in a Pokemon game, period. The Wild Area is also another example of a novel and fun experience that breaks the Pokemon tradition of solely random encounters. And I have to admit, for a first rendition of this concept, it's pretty solid. I had hours of fun experiencing what this feature had to offer, and I especially liked how the weather system caused certain rare Pokemon to spawn in different places scattered across the map. Then we have this game's gym challenges, which were probably some of the best I've ever experienced. I mean, it really can't be understated just how cocaine-snortingly good it felt after 20-some-odd years to walk down the tunnel and onto the pitch of a massive arena filled with fans to face down against a gym leader. The people cheering, the amped up music rising and changing as the battle progresses, it just really works. And I'm honestly hoping that when they remake Unova they run with this aesthetic there because let's face it, no one does sports and the spectacle itself quite like the USA. And what of the Dynamaxing, you might ask? Well, to my surprise, as an outspoken critic of this feature, I actually liked it quite a bit. Even though it's arguably much more metagame breaking than Megas or Z-Moves, the dynamic itself was cool, very cinematic, and fun to play around with. I do have some issues with it, mainly that it cost fans the much better Z-Moves and Megas, but we'll cover that later. I also think it's worth pointing out that I really did enjoy some of the side characters in these games much more than most other Pokemon titles. Marnie was a decent secondary rival, as was Bede. Their personalities felt more rounded than other comparable characters, and I can see their futures laid out in the inevitable sequels. Sonya, Leon, and several of the gym leaders were also much better written than I had anticipated. They aren't black and white good, but they're much better than what Sun and Moon or X and Y had to offer by a wide margin. And Hop. Oh, how the fanbase seems to hate Hop. I may earn a dislike for this, but fuck it. Hop was actually a pretty decent rival. Hell, he's arguably more compelling than the player character in these games because at least he experiences growth and changes throughout the course of the story. And yeah, by all means, Hop was actually a pretty decent character. At least in comparison with what we've seen from Pokemon over the years. Which is admittedly a pretty low bar. Hell, if you need an example as to how good some of the characters in this game were in comparison to other Pokemon games, 
Just take a look at Ball Guy. He oozes swagger and sexuality like no one has ever before him. And he may have just been the best part of these games. The bad. The things that were tried and ultimately didn't work. Now that we've discussed the good, let's take a look at some of the things Game Freak tried that didn't really work out too well. These features aren't necessarily terrible, they just don't really work or wasted valuable time and resources. For example, Pokemon Camp is something I think most Pokemon fans can agree is a good thing. Interacting with Pokemon and watching them interact with each other is a fantastic way of expanding on Pokemon Ami. However, the Curry Dex? That's a whole nother story. I actually did enjoy the Curry minigame, not because it was a blast or anything, but because it added a level of immersive gameplay, and I found myself using it much more than I had initially suspected. That being said, we didn't need a billion different varieties. We didn't even need the curry decks to begin with. 90% of these recipes go completely unused by most players, and the fact that effort was expanded on something that most players won't experience is definitely bad. And speaking of something most players won't get to experience, let's talk about Gigamaxing, which was one of the most marketed features for this game in the first place. In my 45 plus hours of completing nearly every ounce of this game, I never Gigamaxed a single Pokemon. This isn't for lack of trying either. I wanted nothing more than to Gigamax my Pokemon and have some of these awesome designs at my disposal. However, the truth is you can't access Gigamaxing Pokemon until after the 8th gym, which is pretty much at the end of the game. However, if that wasn't bad enough, none of the Pokemon you catch and raise yourself can actually Gigamax which means that that Grimmsnarl you caught with great IVs and an adamant nature will never be able to Gigamax. This is because Gigamax-capable Pokémon can only be caught in max raid battles, which are completely random so you straight up never know if the one you want will ever spawn. This alone feels so un-Pokémon to me. I thought the whole point of these games was catching Pokémon, befriending them, and making them stronger. Not catching them, using them, and then casting them aside for a version that has access to features your original never even had a chance to access. And as if that wasn't bad enough, even if the Gigamaxed Pokémon you want does spawn, there's no guarantee that you'll be able to catch it, because even if you beat it, the capture rates for these Pokémon are seemingly very low. Out of the countless Gigamax-capable Pokémon I fought and defeated, I've only caught one, and that was a Butterfree that didn't even spawn in my game. I normally would keep trying because, let's face it, Pokemon is no stranger to RNG, but there's no way to guarantee a max raid battle spawning in your game. And the only way to generate more is to complete every single one on the map, which is tedious and time consuming to say the least. Right now there are players who have figured out exploits to fix this terrible game design, but you can't really give Game Freak credit for that because they're just that exploits, meaning that the game is broken. But this terrible RNG wouldn't even be that bad if I wasn't practically always forced to play with the computer's brain-dead AI, which makes some of the single-handedly most bizarre choices of all time. Oh, you're fighting a 5-star Dynamaxed Toxapex? Here's a Magikarp with Hydro Pump, a Solrock with Rock Polish, and an Eevee with Helping Hand. Playing with the AI is as good as playing by yourself. Uh, no, wait, scratch that. But I would honestly rather play by myself, at least that way I wouldn't constantly be losing because my team of trash AI doesn't work. This ends up making max raid battles hard, but for all the frustratingly wrong reasons. But why not team up with other human beings, you might ask? Well, the short answer is that I've tried that. I must have done over four dozen raid battles at this point, and I've been helped by a total of five people, never more than one at a time. I don't know if it's because most people don't want a majority of the Pokemon that spawn in these raid battles, or if it's because the online functionality is busted, but either way, this heavily marketed feature of battling with four other people has just straight up never happened for me. Even in the rarer Gigamax raid battles, you figure people might want a shot at. 
Oh, and speaking of online functionality, I won't say this game's trading and battling system is completely broken, but it's a hefty step in the wrong direction, and it borders on being completely pointless. You can't put things on the GTS anymore because they straight up got rid of it for some reason, and you can't communicate with trade partners, so it's practically impossible to get what you want. I've had more luck getting what I wanted from surprise trades, which is absolutely insane. Maybe they were trying to add a sense of immersion by making players feel like a retarded Mr. Mime with no arms or legs, and if so, good job, because it worked. And online battling? Well, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Showdown does it better. Let's face it, online Pokemon battles pale in comparison to the simple and free service that Showdown provides. Sword and Shield have some very awkward forced time limits that break traditional game flow, and turns of combat take way too long because of how slow animations and texts appear. The only thing that would have made online battling in these games better than on Showdown would have been the animations, and well, let's face it, the animations in these games may be some of the worst I've ever seen in a Pokemon game. Sure, they're clearer and more well-defined, but most of them look ugly and are very, very slow. And well, just take a look at this Dynamaxed rabbit shooting fire out of its asshole. Keep in mind, these are both a new Pokemon and a new dynamic introduced in this game, which leaves no excuse for this terrible image to exist. Quote unquote features like these really make you wonder why these games would even include them in the first place, especially when there's so much ugly in this game that really needs polishing. Speaking of ugly, let's move on. Oh boy, now it's time to talk about the reality of these games. The true core game that exists underneath their carefully marketed, rose-tinged nostalgia lenses, and man oh fucking man, this game is buggy. I have never played a AAA title, let alone a Pokemon game, that was this riddled with this many glitches, bugs, and design flaws. And I've played every Bethesda game on release. I literally couldn't play this game without experiencing multiple bugs. Things like Pokemon trainers randomly disappearing throughout the entirety of the game, wild Pokemon just spinning in a circle like some kind of 2-bit carnival attraction, and the game straight up crashing. We all knew they were going to be rushing these games out for the holidays, but god damn, we did not know they were going to be this rushed. The prime example of this rushed nature could be found in the gyms and gym challenges themselves. The first couple gym challenges had some really interesting environments with fun little side challenges that you had to complete. This one had you on an amusement park ride. This one has you catching Pokemon competitively. However, after you reach the halfway point in these games, these quote unquote challenges literally just devolve into the gym leader telling you to battle someone, you battling them, and then just moving on to the next person. It was absolutely mind blowing to see these games regress as I played them. And it felt like the developers were like, oh, holy shit, we have four months to finish this game. Just make them have double battles. For God's sake, one of the cities, and I say that in quotes, is literally just a straight line of trainers followed by a gym leader who can't even Dynamax. There's just so much wrong with this. It's not even funny. And the gall Game Freak has to call Spikesmooth a town, let alone a city, is astounding. Indeed, everything in the latter half of this game is completely and 100% half-baked. So much so that I think I caught Salmonella from this game, seeing as how after I played it, I got so sick I couldn't make a video for two weeks. It's almost like with everything this game does to try to immerse you in the Galar region, there's three times as many things that seek to break that immersion. The wild area, for example, something I touted as being good, is what I have not so affectionately dubbed the glitch zone. Because if you can make it from one side of this map to the other without experiencing one bug, frame drop, or spinning Gyarados, then you've essentially had the picture perfect experience of what Game Freak wanted you to have. And that picture perfect experience is this. Graphics so bad I literally haven't seen them replicated since the GameCube days. Look. I know people gave Game Freak hell about the trees, but seriously, what the fuck? These graphics straight up suck ass, and that's as eloquently as I can put it. No matter who you are, these things undoubtedly break immersion. If it's not the trees, it's the glitches. If it's not the glitches, it's the way characters in Pokemon just magically pop into frame. 
If it's not that, it's the horrendous frame drops that make the game straight up freeze. In a game that should have made me feel more than ever like a Pokemon trainer surrounded by the immersive and responsive world, I've never felt more like a 20-something year old schlub playing a game for kids. The ugly truth of these games is just that. Ugly. So much of these games is straight up broken, and even though they can still be played, it's obvious that these games desperately need more work. Work that I can guarantee they will never receive, because let's face it, Game Freak made a cash grab, it worked, and they're probably already working on next year's cash grab, Ultra Omega Sword, and Ultra Alpha Shield. And guess what? They'll probably make even more money with that game when they announce the big new feature is gonna be the full national decks. Er, you know what? I'm honestly giving Game Freak too much credit. They'll probably just add 50 or so Pokemon and call that enough new content to merit a re-release. This game is definitely not worth 20 extra dollars. I mean, I finished the entire thing minus the curry decks in just over 45 hours of gameplay. For reference, my copy of Ultra Moon has over 88 hours played, and that game wasn't even a top 5 core series game to me. I'm not gonna say these games are the worst games I've ever played, I had fun playing them, but for 20 extra dollars, half the playtime, and a buggy experience, they weren't worth it. Eh, whatever. A franchise I've loved since I was a kid has turned its back on me and the fanbase. At least The Mandalorian is really good.